Hey, get out of the shot. <laughs> so it's engine week, and today we stop off at Viking Aircraft Engines to give you a quick tour. Where does everything start? Yeah, sure, we'll go over every little aspect of that, but the first thing that I have to do is we have a vendor that we source our engines through. So essentially we have a certain number of specifications that we want, which means low mileage, new year, no damage, as perfect as we can get it. And I get pictures sent to me, we look those over, they arrive here at the shop, and then we obviously go over the engine itself and approve it or don't approve it, and then we move on from there. There's not uh, a fresh pallet that just arrived today to be able to capture that, but they, they do come on pallets. Yes, And correct. then from there, what do you guys do? Do you, you clean it? Do you, what do you do from the pallet stage? First, we do a visual inspection on everything, and then we take it on over, make sure the VIN matches you know, the information that we had, and then it goes on over to Sal, who works on the engine, and there's a bunch of parts and pieces that kind of get taken off that just belong to the car itself from the old harness. We just get rid of all that stuff and then we replace it with our own. The engine itself stays exactly the same. So the internals are exactly what Honda did. We add our external pieces, our wiring harness, our computer, everything that makes it a Viking engine. And something that's really important and our customers always have a lot of questions about is the VIN number. Something that's really great about these engines is we get them in and the VIN number is right on the side of the right in the side of the engine, not the vehicle. But you can see it down here it shows it and then you can take this VIN number right here specifically from Honda and then you can see exactly what happened to your engine and that this had 8 or 9 miles on it and there was shipping damage and that's how we received this engine. So you essentially get the latest technology at a lower price and you know exactly where your engine came from. Okay, so after you check the engines in, inspect, verify VIN number and all that stuff, uh, what's the very next step on the build process? Well, the next step is to take the engine and just uh, kind of break it down into, remove the intake manifold, remove any old parts, or anything that's not gonna be reused, and also parts that are going to be reused but might have to be modified. One thing will be like an intake manifold, comes off the engine, put aside, exhaust off the engine, put aside. Uh, and then when um, we can either then rebuild these pieces and put them back on the engine right away, or more commonly, these then become sub-assemblies. Uh, we might do 20 intake manifolds, we might do uh, 20 wire looms that go on the engine. As far as the wire loom, uh, very little is reused, sometimes connectors or the shells they're called. Uh, special tools are used to remove them from the harness and then uh, uh, our technician Sal will then string Tefcel wiring, aviation wiring onto this board. We have different boards for different engines, of course the, the 90, 100, uh, 130 and 190 engine all have different wiring bo boards and then uh, new, new pins in some instances and reused shells in some instances are then wired onto it. At the end of the harness is, of course, the big connectors that go into the ECU that kind of operate the whole works. And that's one thing that we do have that's different than the car, and that is the, the ECU or the electronic control unit. Each engine goes through a dyno uh, process where the uh, t spark timing, the cam timing, uh, fuel injection pulse width, all those things are programmed for the engine so that it becomes the Viking engine at the end. Uh, other parts that are made as far as sub-assemblies are uh, flywheels, the gearbox, uh, some muffler parts, propeller hubs obviously, they're all forged and you have to put in the bushings and so there's a lot of little things that get done. Uh, gears get unpacked from their shipping containers uh, and then sub-assemblies of gearboxes are put together, the uh, front housing, the rear housing, and then complete gearboxes are made up, and then gearboxes are then eventually installed on the engine after the flywheel and the coupling system is installed. So there's a, there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Let's, uh, let's tour the shop a little bit and I can show you some other pieces.
Hey everyone, let me take just a moment here to thank our sponsors that make all this possible. Great companies like Airworks, AirTech Coatings, Clemens Insurance Agency, Acme Aero, Stoll Creek Aviation, InFlight Camp, Wheelin Aerospace Technologies. So take a moment after this video to say hello to all of them and remember to check out the affiliate links in the description below. And remember, just build it. Let's get back to it. All right, to back up just a moment, you mentioned earlier you, you do some modifications to the intake and throttle body. Explain what goes on there. Well, the important part, of course, is like what Alyssa was talking about, is there are no internal changes to the engine. We want everybody to understand that uh, the robotically put together Honda engine that you would get in your uh, Civic when you went to the dealership is still what you're going to get. There are some things that won't fit in an airplane, like this manifold, is in the car it, it kind of curves up on top of the engine like this of course you want to get as low of a profile as we can so that has been rotated around the other way and an adapter is made to do that as far as back to the sub-assembly parts um, for instance 20 of these are just made up um, so these are the original throttle bodies but we don't use the electronic throttle that you have in the car so a little bit of machining is done in here and then Whatever needs to be done to it, the idle screw and so forth, are all pre-done and then uh, put in the box and then we do like 10, maybe 15 sub-assemblies and then we get back to assembling the engine. Further sub-assemblies, it might not look like much, but you would find an alternator like this on maybe a John Deere tractor and a list price could be like six, seven hundred dollars. Now, of course, we're not after buying those kinds of expensive parts for your engine. We want the, that quality, but we have to source. So Viking has their own part number with Nip and Denso, uh, which is the genuine version of this alternator. You can tell by the ceramic coating in here. Uh, as well as some other things on the alternator, of course, the Nippon Denso embossed uh, emblem. We then machine, or have machine, because we're not a machine shop. We are a design and an engine building shop. A pulley for it that corresponds to our serpentine belt. And that's the alternator that then is prepped as in every mounting bracket or screw that it needs is done and then they're put back in the box and ready to go for final assembly of the engine. Same with the starters. Uh, starters are the same starter that came in with the low mileage engine, so you end up with a Honda starter. Um, not much that's done to it other than making sure that uh, it is a good product that can then be used on an airplane engine. And it is, of course, the original starter and not an aftermarket or low, low budget starter. I think one, one thing that is kind of neat for the customer, uh, most people in today's world believe in their car engine. And most people have realized that, why is my car so reliable? Uh, it didn't used to be, I had to go like get tune-ups and all that. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them being the ignition system. And that might be one place where we get a little flack, especially from like old school die-hard aviation guys that are like, you know, if it doesn't have two plugs, it shouldn't be in the air type of thing. But, you know, it's so easy to say stuff like that without truly understanding what's behind it. The engine does have, in fact, lots of different ways where it can stay running. Um, it doesn't have like one carburetor. It has basically four, because it's got four injectors. It doesn't have one way of firing the spark plug. It has four. It has four drivers in the computers, it's got four pl uh, plugs, it's got, and again, the plugs are not the old plugs, they're iridium platinum plugs. So right away, we're like tripling the lifetime and the reliability of the old school plugs. So it's very easy to make generalizations that in today's world, they don't, they don't hold true anymore. Um, this is what the coil looks like, you know, like it used to be uh, a distributor, and then you had long wires going to your spark plugs. Uh, the wires are actually uh, kind of like a maintenance item. So automotive designers and technicians and, and people that are designing these engines say, well, how can we eliminate failure points? You know, 
just like aviation, they also don't want failure points because uh, cars, they want to sell their cars. They don't want to have problems with their cars. They don't want consumer reports to say, well, your car is a lemon. They want to be able to sell them. So what they did is they eliminated the wires. They put the coil right on top of the spark plug. Uh, there's power and ground to each one. And the actual amount of juice that it takes to fire the coil is just a couple of milliamps on a signal wire that fires the coil at the proper time uh, you know, without these big wires and, and things like that that are all over the engine. So there's a lot of little details that you should not overlook about modern Honda engines versus even engines that were made 10 years ago in cars or airplanes. So now after the engine's been assembled, we take it over to our test cart. We don't run every engine with a propeller because it doesn't really prove too much uh, about this type of engine. This type of engine can run without a propeller, just like it ran without a propeller in a car. What is a little bit different, um, or what is similar to other test stands is that we do have power and a fuel pump and an alternator, and we can read a few things uh, manually. Uh, we obviously have a battery to start it, and we have some fuel. We have like a little octopus here where we can plug into different types of engines depending on which size connector. So that's already set up and ready to go. Same with the, the main, like different starters for different engines and the, your main power and your ground and so forth. So very adaptable to different engines. Uh, ECU, is, and this is where we're getting away from the traditional and more into a computer controlled engine is that we then plug the engine into our laptop, uh, get our software going and then that's mostly what is being checked during the run, uh, making sure the cams are actually moving because uh, they are variable cams, um, uh, that we have proper fuel flow, that the uh, temperature sensors are actually operating through their full range and things like that. So that's mostly uh, what's important to check in addition to, of course, making sure that the gearbox is running cool and the engine is running cool and things like that, that the alternator is putting out current. So some of the traditional stuff and some that are a little bit different. Power and the key. Okay, so over here, you're gonna explain what is all included in your kit for the firewall forward, essentially? Uh, yeah, so we have a customer we're starting to pack things up for. So this is kind of an over look of what is supplied in our kit. You have everything from the mount to the cowling, the propeller, the radiator, and we have every little bit and piece that you're really gonna need for the installation, which is a lot different. We like to supply everything so our customers don't have to source for their contactors and their coolant and their batteries. So we supply everything from the bolts that go to your firewall onto the mount and everything forward from there. And um, we have extras and things like wiring kits to help those that don't necessarily know what gauge wire they're going to need to wire their airplane, what kind of crimpers they're going to need. So we do the best we can to help people move along in their build and not slow them down. So the more that we can supply, the better. So I guess if you want to, you can always glance over everything here, but it's kind of a basic um, kit that we have, our coolant, radiator, propeller, spinner, dual throttle system for this gentleman, all the plumbing, the fuel, the fuel, two and a half gallon header tank, that Jan still has to put that one together. So every little piece that we have is available and we like to supply it all as a kit. All right, so uh, Jan, obviously over the years, you've done a lot of different airframes uh, with your engines, but somebody comes to you new with something you haven't done before, what's the process of getting that customer serviced? Or um, I think because of what you just said that we have done so many, uh, it's become real easy. Like for instance, an engine mount, here's a book uh, that shows you know all kinds of engine mounts for different engines, different airplanes. Um, and as you know, there's kind of like only so many firewall layouts. You, you have kind of 
the Kit Fox series of airplanes, which also is maybe like an Avid and a Highlander, and it goes on and on and on. So that kind of a shape, that width with a square bottom and the rounded top has been done many, many times. And usually you find those firewalls on totally different airplane companies being within a half an inch uh, of each other as far as vertical and horizontal width. So that helps. Um, engine mounts are very standard for what we're doing. Uh, if you're using 5.8 chromoly tubing with 060 wall or you're using uh, uh, three-quarter tubing with 049 wall uh, for certain distances and you triangulate that good you can very quickly uh, without any actual load testing design a mount that you know is plenty strong for the airplane so that helps uh, standardization as far as the airplanes like I said uh, standardization as far as always using 4132 tubing, which is the industry standard always TIG welding um, same with cowlings. Uh, cowling that works on one airplane might work on another one. We always save what we call the plug, which means that the plug can now be modified with minor tweaks for different airplanes and we can make a new female mold for different airplanes. So a customer that has a scratch build or uh, buys an old Kit Fox or they do whatever can now get with us and uh, uh, supply Alyssa with uh, dimensional basic dimensions from drawing something on cardboard cutting out a template or something send it to us and we can we can very quickly get a firewall forward kit together that would fit extremely well on that particular airplane thanks for watching another episode in our engine week series return tomorrow for our next episode here on the Experimental Aircraft Channel. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.